You're listening to a podcast from the Abbey Theatre's Oral History Project. For more information about the archive, visit abbeytheatre.ie. The Great Hunger by Tom McIntyre premiered on the Peacock stage at the Abbey Theatre in 1983. It marked a unique collaboration between the playwright, director Patrick Mason and actor Tom Hickey. In this podcast, we hear Tom Hickey, Patrick Mason and actor Breechney Nochthan talking about the rehearsal process. Well, the experience is just being handed a really fascinating piece of work, which you're not quite sure how on earth it does work, uh, but there's so much, there's something in it that intrigues you. Uh, with the great hunger, I was absolutely blown away by it. And this is the thing, you, you get something and it's, it's not all there, but you, there's something in it where you just go, oh wow. And I remember the wow factor was the mother, was, was the, the mother in the kitchen, yes, you know, yes. the, the chest of drawers, which is the mother. And I thought that was so inspired and so extraordinary. And the possibilities, the, the, the power of that. <laughs> and then he had on the other side of the stage, it, it, where the, the church area was, he had this sort of card table where the priest did some three card tricks. <laughs> and I said, Tom, you don't mind my saying so, but you know, you have this unbelievable kind of iconic creature in the kitchen and the three card trick. I said, there's no contest, you know, there's no power. You've, you've, you, you've got this atomic power station in one corner of the stage and the, and the other stage is slick, no nonsense and all that. Oh, no, no, you're right, you're right, no, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, and, and, you know, we, the more we talked about it, and, and in fact I did actually say to him, well, you know, we've got to get an object that has that same presence there. And, and I said, what about a tabernacle? <laughs> well, you can't think more potent, you know, and, and the, that's it, you know, and we were off. We were off. And I tell that story really, uh, not, not because it reflects well on me, but, 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 but you know, that's the process. Yes. That you're kind of constantly saying, there's enough there that it, it catches you. But then you say, well, why is this corner of the stage not catching me? Why does this character not work for me? Why does this scene not work for me? And you've got all this power here, why not here? And then you just start this dialogue, this, this constant process. And then, of course, in rehearsal, particularly with Great Hunger, you know, there were huge sequences. I mean, he gave us this fantastic resource, this extraordinarily detailed scenario, full of images and objects and gestures, each one of which had to be animated and explored and then rejected or, you know, absorbed, depending on its... It's impact. He, and you know, there's so much of rehearsal with, with a new play which is about testing. It's testing the theory against the practice, the idea against the presence, and saying, actually, it looks great on paper, but something doesn't work. Why? What is it? So, you, you know, there's a lot of that going on, and, and that was a very collaborative process. I went off to the author I'd never met before. There's a line in The Great Hunger, Patrick Maguire went home and made cocoa. This was in the first week. I said, uh, Mr. McIntyre, um, how do you, Patrick Maguire went home and made cocoa. What do you do? What, what surrounds that? What do you do? He was a pause. Look, he says, pitch it somewhere between the enigmatic and the quotidian and you won't go wrong. <laughs> that was an early event. So I said, it was rather like when Patrika Ionesco went, boom, we're in business here. Yeah. So uh, Patrick very rightly said, as far as I remember, look, we don't know where this is going to go or what we're going to do, but basically what we started off doing was improvising, which never went on in the Abbey before, in my view. I, maybe it did, but not to my knowledge. Improvise it. Scene one, whatever it is, what's this? Improvise it. And we get some development in the middle of the improvisation. And it mightn't be as prominent as written. 
things like that happened all the time with McIntyre's work, that there would be an object, or uh, mostly objects, who are in the original script. And when we sort of began to work on the core of the scene, they were never used, so they just walked out. But something else walked in that became very important. So it was all open, as Patrick would watch. Oh, so these, some of these improvisations were crazy. And there was one scene in particular in the original Great Hunger. We called it the Tangler scene. It was, it was set on, it was surreal, but set at the fair. And the Tangler at the fair is the, is the guy in between the farmer who's selling the animal and the buyer, that guy who comes down and buys cows for butchers and that. And the tangler brings the spits on the two hands and they make a bargain. So we worked on a tangler scene for at least two days. And he, I think it was a Friday morning, I remember McIntyre coming and he says, Patrick, I've solved the tangler scene. Wonderful, says Patrick, that's wonderful. Yes, he says, it's cut. I loved working on the McIntyre plays, the early, the early McIntyre plays. That was a, a completely different uh, way of working. And it was a fluke that I was actually uh, cast in the first, I wasn't cast in the first uh, production, in the first uh, production of um, um, The Great Hunger, when it went into rehearsals, because I was, uh, I was in uh, Mary Make Believe, uh, which is a musical on the Abbey stage. And um, Marnie Gráinne was cast as Tom uh, Hickey's sister. And Marnie Gráinne had an accident. She fell off her bicycle. And uh, Joe Dowling said, uh, you will uh, take over from Marnie Gráinne. And it, I was very fortunate, really, uh, that, I, that somebody else had, had, uh, had to drop out. And I was, you know, as a member of the company, again, you just played. You, you, have no, you had no choice as mm. to what you played, so you played. You know, like, and it was great for me, you know, because I was much younger. Uh, tackling an older part and stuff, but that was something that I had seen. That I had seen other, I had seen actors do. They had started rehearsals. They had actually, um, I think they were they were two weeks into rehearsals. So uh, the script will be left for you at the stage door, and uh, so I picked up the script, and of course it, the script was not the, like a, the usual script that you would get. There was like um, uh, uh, McGuire whatever, moves to the gate, explore in rehearsal. Uh, uh, Mary Ann comes in, left with a bucket. Uh, again, explore. So I went, oh my God. Oh my God, because we were used to a beginning, a middle and an end in that order. The great the, Tom's work was not a beginning, a middle and an end in that order. So I... Ailish McBride was the uh, was the stage director, so I went in on the Monday, and Patrick was directing Patrick Mason, and Tom McIntyre was in the room. And at the time, and that was another that's an, a wonderful thing that 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 the Abbey kind of that Abbey training gave you. At the time, I was like, I was in my I suppose I was I certainly wasn't uh, Mary Ann's age, you know. She was a spinster's sister to 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 Maguire in the in the poem. Uh, she was uh, uh, she'd be in her forties or late forties or fifties. Uh, so I went, oh my god. So uh, I went into rehearsal and uh, everybody was like there were no scripts. There were everybody okay into the middle of the floor and do something. And okay, link in. So this was the, you know, this was how Patrick, and that was the wonderful thing uh, about Patrick, and, and, and I, I felt it, Tom was very fortunate uh, to have a director like Patrick, it, 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 you know, directing those, the beginning, uh, those, the, the cycle, you know, because he understood that it wasn't like that it wasn't a normal script, in the sense of a normal script, you know. So uh, that was very scary. That was very, very scary because we weren't, you know, you, you didn't have any formal training in movement. You didn't have anything. So you just kind of had to kind of, you know, get, you know, draw on something. But it was also very exciting. I began to realise as time went on that for some strange reason I could empathise. I sort of knew how it worked with it. 
we, we, we don't know, as Patrika said, from why. It was just an accident. But I could sus. So I began to, uh, you know, McIntyre invite me up to the house in Ranelagh and we'd discuss the whole thing, etc. I began to get very close to him because I sort of had an instinct of some, it's hard to describe, an instinct. And uh, it would cost him nothing, as I said, to look up at a scene that's been done. I said, who wrote this? And he'd write something else immediately in the rehearsal room. But the interesting thing then, word began to get out in, in the Abbey that these lunatics were shouting and roaring and doing all sorts of strange things. And we became known as the lunatics in the basement. It was extremely demanding, physically, mentally, and every other way. And the real thing was that then, scene by scene by scene, we went through. And of course, one scene, the discovery we made in that would affect another scene. And it was all going, shaping itself in a sort of a way. We did the first half. Jesus, I said to myself. It's all very well to be doing this scene by scene, but am I going to be able to do And I haven't done the second half yet. I, said, I got an awful fright. And I remember the morning of a technical dress. It was more a dress, Saturday morning. I was so exhausted. I said, I think I'm going to die. I'll probably die on the stage this morning. I feel so bad. I feel so not ready for this. But anyway, I did it. And of course, then I got used to it. But it was, it was really, it was really tough. But it was, but clearly it was working. McIntyre remembers in rehearsal every day, every moment, as part of that collaboration. I mean, he used to exercise with us. We'd do all our warm-ups and, you know, improvise. And McIntyre would part, as I would be. You know, there was a genuinely uh, daily collaborative process going on. Tom was sitting in the room all the time. Well, Tom was never one for a lot of dialogue. He did not like, you know, he would not. He would ask, I remember asking Tom, um, how do I play this? How, you know, just to give me a sort of thing. And he said, treat it as a laundry list. This would, this would be, you know, this would be your note. Treat it as a laundry list. Or, um, so he was, it was always the movement, the gesture, the, you know. He was sitting in, in and he'd go away and write a sort of a, a scene around that. And you, as an actor as well, brought a lot to it. So it was that collaboration between director, writer and actor. That, um, that 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 really um, we've and and we and in the sense of the great hunger, you went back to the poem. You went back to the source. I remember going back to the source a lot and and, and looking and reading and stuff and and trying to get you know draw from that and apply it then to to to, to your character because at the end of the day you had to um, you know and again that was very very I mean. Um, uh, we played the peacock and uh, we could hear people leaving and people going rubbish and we went to the Edinburgh Festival and on our first day we just heard the seats going, seats leaving, going going up and we thought, and that was very difficult, it was difficult as actors because you, you know you had to believe in what you were doing and stuff and yet we played, we went to uh, Anna McCarrick and it was, it was a big fundraising thing and there were two nights, one night for a, a, as the gala fundraising and we played it in the shed and uh, I remember Patrick and Tony Wakefield because uh, there were cows that had to be milked before we actually went in and set up and they cleaned out the shed, cleaned out, we set up, there were rats everywhere so it was, it was fantastic, open, open air and uh, the, the ordinary members, if you could call it, ordinary members of the public, got every nuance in that piece, and you went, that's fantastic, it's fantastic. So kind of moments like that, as an actor and as a, you know, were very special, very special. And, and very fortunate in with Tom Hickey, who was very, you know, who responded to that in a very, in a, in a, in a sort of totally different 
you know, performance to anything that had been seen before. But, but yes, within the Abbey, within the Abbey building itself, uh, people were saying, what, is, what in the name of God is that? What is going on? You know? It was a struggle. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was kind of, it, there was a feeling of, oh God, they're mad. I have to tell you a funny story. McIntyre and Patrick would have discussions after the previews to tell the audience that many of the audience were very angry because they didn't understand it with their heads, instead of letting it wash over them, you know. Patrick would say, no, 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 I, I didn't ask you if you understood it. I did ask you if you recognised it. That was Patrick's bottom line. An old fellow stood up in the third row and he says, McIntyre, he says, I've been watching you for ages now, he says, and you're up to your old tricks again. <laughs> people, got, people got frustrated because they didn't understand it with their heads. It wasn't meant for their heads. But extraordinarily, some of the people that were giving out about it would come to me a few months later and say, I still can't forget that show. See, this was really reassuring. And that was 83. When we came back to The Great Hunger in 86, Patrick had had a rethink, Tom had had a rethink, and everybody, it, the, script, the script was altered in many, many... Marlene Dietrich seeing that, and Maguire going up to the tabernacle. That was an innovation in the second one. As far as my memory, memory tells me, yeah, that was one of the particular ones that was sensational, worked in my view, in a sensational manner. They got rid of three fates who had candles and things in the first one. That went. Instead, rushing through the gate came three or four of them in gas masks. McIntyre said, this is set during the war. We're not giving it enough attention. And that's where the gas masks and Lily Marlene came from. So it was, and Patrick. Was Patrick brought in Lily Marlene, I think. The, the effect was Patrick, what, what went on a lot of the time was that poor Patrick, the rational Englishman, with two irrational, myself mainly and McIntyre, on each side was an extraordinary cocktail, you know. But he, but he was able to shape all this lunacy. I think that maybe it had to do with where you were from. I think that the rural people hadn't, hadn't as much trouble with it as the, the metro people. Um, and of course, there was the Kavna fan club, as it were, you know. It nearly didn't get on. There was legalities passing between Ireland and America. And there were some Patrick Kavna fans, saw, enforcers thought it was sacrilegious to do it. You know, you had that sort of reaction. We even had a visit from one of the religious organizations because there's a masturbation scene with the bellows. But then that was going to happen regularly in the forthcoming years with McIntyre on the stage. Uh, the, the audience in Russia, to my view, is the same as here. Uh, I sort of twig something. Dominic Bean wrote a play the last line of which was, Mother Ireland, get off me back. But then I realized when we were in Russia that Russia is known as Mother Russia as well. So it's female um, irrational energy that we share, I think. We're quite similar in many, many ways. So they liked, I thought they liked the great hunger a lot, I have to say, in, in Russia. Um, where it wasn't popular 
in a very decided manner was Manhattan. The Irish Americans thought it was a disgraceful reflection on lovely religious Ireland, that this was outrageous and they left. You could hear them leaving when we were performing in, down near where the Twin Towers was. It was down there in a college space. But they, they were scandalised by it. It wasn't popular with the Irish Americans. It was in the wrong place. It should have been further uptown, off Broadway or something. It just wasn't suitable. Um, but it drove some people crazy because they, had, they weren't able, quite able to adjust the way you perceive it, this stuff. And then they'd recognise, as Patrick says, some of it and then it helped them with the next bit that confronted them. So it was a battle royal. It was a battle royal, you know, but great. Great. I remember once we arrived in from rehearsing in some space near the big tree there in Dorset Street, forgotten the name of the place. And we walked in through the front door of the Abbey and all the fire alarms went off. As if, look out, here they come. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this podcast from the Abbey Theatre's Oral History Project. For more information about the archive, visit abbeytheatre.ie.